Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, uh, let's have a quick look. Uh, so, uh, ah, Gerard's on line. That's fantastic, because uh, uh, Gerard um, asked me a question only yesterday at uh, the lake. And it was uh, the same question that was echoed by somebody um, uh, in the week on online. Uh, sorry, I just cut myself shaving. It's not good. Really not good. Um, so, uh, yeah, Gerard asked me a question um, uh, uh, on Sunday and it was uh, echoed it was exactly the same question as somebody asked me online so I'm going to um, I'm going to talk about that quite a bit um, and then move on to some other other questions that have been asked so um, we're going to start with uh, this question about the difference between unpacking uh, which is what I recommend people do when they when they're diving and um, mouthfill Mouthfill is not a technique that I teach um, unless people are diving uh, deeper than 70 or 80 meters then I'm happy to teach them mouthfill. Uh, up to that depth mouthfill is dangerous and mouthfill will um, oh man I had a dodgy dodgy razor blade it's dreadful. Um, I can just see myself on, on the monitor there I've got bleeding everywhere. So uh, mouthfill is a dangerous technique um, and I don't recommend anybody does it unless you're diving 70 or 80 meters. And what's the difference? Well, the fundamental part is uh, of, of both exercises is taking air out of the lungs when um, you've gone so deep the pressure um, or rather you know the lungs are compressed due to the pressure and the diaphragm no longer works and you still got to get air out of the um out of the lungs so you use an un uh, unpacking mm. to fill the mouth full of air mm. um and yeah so using the cheeks the tongue the throat to pull air out of the lungs into the mouth to equalize with now if you are doing your bedtime stretches okay and uh, the bedtime stretches let's move that away slightly the bedtime stretches are designed to to flex the chest inwards to simulate being at depth so when you breathe out um, uh, sit up, push the belly out, you're pulling in the, the chest. And I'm actually doing a bedtime stretch there. That's my chest moving in. And if the chest can move in, you're going to be able to, you know, you, you, you're accepting that pressure at that depth. So the more flexible you are, the deeper you can go. Right? Very simple. The more flexibility you have in the chest, the deeper you can go. All right. So um, we do bedtime stretches to generate uh, that flexibility to allow us to go deeper. But the question is, at any depth, how do you know if you are uh, if if your chest is flexing? if you're flexible enough to be at that depth. And the way you check is by unpacking. So if you can unpack, your chest is moving inwards and you're flexible and you're not going to damage your lungs. If you can't unpack, your chest is not moving and therefore you, you haven't got the flexibility going any deeper you're in danger of damaging your lungs. So, as we dive with no tanks, and, and then we suggest that you unpack mm. and then equalize. Unpack mm. and equalize. 
So every time you unpack, you're checking to see if you have got flexibility. If you've got flexibility, you're safe at that depth. Mm. I'm good. I've unpacked. I know I'm good at that depth. Equalize. Unpacking, pulling up air at a depth tells you you're safe to be at that depth. Mouthfeel, on the other hand, you find the depth that you can't equalize anymore at. And then the next dive, you fill your mouth full of air at a shallower depth to get you past the depth that you couldn't unpack at. So unpacking tells you you're safe at that depth because you've got the flexibility to unpack so the chest's still moving, you're not going to damage your lungs. Mouthfeel circumnavigates this and allows you to go deeper than you can unpack, deeper than you're safe at. If you have to use mouthfeel, you are damaging your lungs. It's black and white. Doesn't matter what anybody tells you. Doesn't matter who says I've been doing it for years and it's now I've never been never had lung squeeze. If you use mouthfeel, in other words, a shallow so at the depth that you can't unpack, that's the depth that you should stop. Unpacking a lot into the mouth. A uh, shallower depth and using that air to take you past the depth that you can't unpack is going to damage your lungs. This is what mouthfeel is. This is why we don't uh, don't use it. The technique's the same: pulling up air, using the cheeks and the throat and the and the tongue to pull air out of the lungs. It's the same, but we use it to test whether we've got flexibility and therefore we're at the right place, it's safe to be there. If you use it as a mouthfeel, you're circumnavigating that test. There are no pain receptors in the lungs, so you can't tell whether you ripped your lungs. There is pain receptors in your ears, which is why you can feel, oh, I can't equalize, you feel a pain. So hopefully that's black and white and nice and clear the difference between mouth fill and unpacking. We use unpacking to tell that we're safe to be at that depth. Mouth fill goes past, allows you to go past that safety depth. And that's it, black and white. Now, to illustrate this, another thing you'll see, uh, which uh, uh, kind of falls into this, you'll hear, uh, not so much now, it was a trendy maybe five years ago, uh, but most agencies now have moved away from this, um, but uh, you say five years ago, you had a lot of people talking about diaphragm flexibility. Okay, so uh, you'd see a lot of people sitting uh, cross-legged on, on a uh, on a rock uh, arm, and they're pulling up the diaphragm. Uriander Banda, pulling up on the diaphragm. Yeah. And they say this, uh, that, that, and some people still teach it, but they, they used to teach that this uh, flexibility in the diaphragm allows you to go deeper. It does not. Okay, it's because the diaphragm can never move up into this part of the chest. Okay, so as the lungs are compressing, something has to take that place. Okay, the diaphragm cannot move up that far to... to, to um, uh, take the place. The other weird thing is, if you see a picture of any deep free diver, they're never with their with their diaphragm squeezed up. Their chest is always in, and you see their wetsuits are flapping as their chest's moved in. So, if people are teaching you to do diaphragm flexibility for depth, it doesn't work. It's it's good for fitness, it's good for uh, control, etc., etc. But for going deep. It doesn't have any any bearing on it. And to show this, uh, I'm going to show a little video. So this is uh, me on a sled, 
and you can see, see that little question mark of silver that's kind of nearly touching my chest. As I'm going deeper and unpacking and equalizing, a hands free equalize, so you won't see me put my hand to my nose, and you can see my chest is moving away from the sled there. See that gap as it gets darker and deeper, and you can see at 10 meters on the left, you have that picture there, um, you can see my chest is, oh, let's start that again. So my chest at 10 meters is touching the sled. And as I'm going deeper, it's moving away from the sled. And this dives to um, 60 meters. So you can see the gap is growing and growing and growing. And that's because my chest is flexing inwards. And then I'll put this picture up again. You can see the difference between how thick my chest is and how thin it is. So this is chest flexibility. This comes from bedtime stretches. Uh, we've covered bedtime stretches a couple of times. I uh, did it two weeks ago. There's a video, um, and and we do it in in pool sessions as well. Um, so bedtime stretches allow flexibility, and this is what's going to allow you to equalize at a deeper depth. Okay, so uh, I've got a couple of other questions. So um, Julian's asked. When Bob swims, Monofin, is, uh, he tends to snake up and down when I, uh, he, swims. <laughs> What's the reason for this and how can Bob improve? Okay, so the Monofin in, uh, came into freediving in the early noughties um, in 2002, 2003. Um, they started coming and they're still... Uh, a lot of people doing stereo fitting back then, but monofin inside coming back in them. And the French um, tended to have a more fluid style. So they would snake through the water like this. Right? Whereas uh, countries that had a strong uh, fin swimming, competitive fin swim, fin swimming um, group of people or, or history, so like Russia and China, um, they they knew how to monofin and they transferred that over or fin swim rather ma managed to transfer that or did transfer it over to free diving where you have a basic position and the head and shoulders don't move and there's some fantastic videos online so the head and shoulders don't move and the movement comes from the hips and the chest whereas the French style was much more like this right. so the French, as I call it, the French style um, is a lot easier for people to do if you've not done any monofinning before, if you haven't got the flexibility in the shoulders, and it feels really nice. It's not particularly efficient because you're you're moving through the water like this as opposed to going straight through it, but it is nice and 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 uh, you know enjoyable. If you decide, all right, I'm going to do some fin swimming or, or monofinning, I'm going to free dive monofinning, and you start to train, then you want to aim towards the Russian fin swimming style, where the hands and the arms uh, are locked, and the shoulders are locked, and the chest drives forward and backwards that allows the hips to go up and down. Now, I'm not suggesting that we um, completely copy the fin swimming style. And if you watch some of the fin swim races, it's incredible, the movements they have. But we should certainly train aiming towards it. And then when we free dive, we can soften it a little bit. So rather than being, and some of them are like mechanical, they're just like click, 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 as they fin. Um, but we can train and aim towards that. And then when we free dive, we can soften it a little bit. Okay. So, um, uh, Julian's uh, question there and that's a, a little bit of a, um, a, a trick question here because I know why Julian uh, moves his head and that's he's, he's got a shoulder injury so there's some tension in there or lack of flexibility and therefore as he's moving it, it's going to be very hard for Julian to keep his head still okay? whereas Bob, his friend may just be starting starting out and snaking through the water which feels really good and it's not necessarily a problem if that's if they're happy doing it and then you're just you know diving for fun that's that's 
that's fine. But if you want to train and improve, you want to aim towards this uh, Russian style where, or the fin swimming style, should I say, I call it Russian style, but that's because that's where I studied fin swimming, where you lock the head and the shoulders and the movement comes from back here as opposed to snaking through the waters. So, yeah, you want to lock and, and drive here. And this is a lot of shoulder flexibility, a lot of upper back flexibility. So um, the monofinning stretching that I did online, oh, it must be a month ago now, maybe two months ago, um, Alethea's offered to um, um, index the, the, the video, so I will get her to do it. So I can, at these points, I can just tell you which video to watch. But there is the monofinning uh, exercises where you use a foam roller on the upper of your upper of your back which will allow that flexibility the movement in the upper in the upper uh, spine which will allow the monofinning technique okay so that's that's kind of where you want to be uh, aiming at okay so hopefully uh, that helps your friend julian um okay and julian's uh, asked another question and it actually relates directly to the last question. So where's the movement? So if you're, in fact, no, let's let's finish the last question. If your head is, if you're if you're trying to monofin efficiently, and there's this this type of movement going on, okay, it's it's not going to be as efficient if, as if you can clamp this and the legs moving because you don't get any propulsion from the head and arms moving, okay. So. You don't want a seesawing effect. You want to lock the head and shoulders and allow the legs, which is where the drive comes from, to, to work. But as we move down, looking, thinking of the legs, the legs aren't going to be rock solid straight and move up and move down. That's that's not how A, the body works, and B, how we're going to generate any sort of uh, movement. We actually want the legs to move like this okay so the hips can drag the legs through the water and the monofin then can do the work and uh, technically we kind of want the same sort of thing on the way down okay um therefore the amount of bend we want in our legs will be similar to similar to this Okay, and then it will change direction where the fin's not working, and then it comes down. So you want a curve. Now the best way to the best thing to to do to find out what curve you want is to watch football, because these people uh, get paid extortionate amounts of money to kick a football uh, the most efficient way possible, or uh, another one example would be American football where they have the kicker. The, the, the kicker, his only job is to come on and kick the American football, you know, 50 yards, 20 yards, however, you know, however far they need to kick it. So you'll see as they run up and kick, um, the leg that's going to kick isn't straight. They don't run up and kick the ball like this. Okay, There's a curve on it. And that's the maximum efficiency to get the, the energy from the hip. And don't, remember, don't forget all the core muscles are where the power center of the body is. So you want to engage the core muscles. So that bend of the leg as they kick a football is the most efficient way to generate energy at, at the foot. Okay. Yeah. They don't, you don't see footballers kick the ball. Uh, you know, with their head fully, leg fully curled up behind them, there's a definite curvature at that point when they kick. They don't kick. They don't kick the ball like this. They don't kick the ball with straight legs. There's a curve to it. Okay, they might they might start from up here. Okay, but that's when we're not we're thinking about free diving here, where that's not an option. Here, this movement here is where the power is generated. So. How much should your legs bend? Watch somebody who's a professional uh, ball kicker. Okay. And that's that's how it will be efficient. Okay. Now, um, fin swimmers, so 
high level professional racing fin swimmers especially in the sprints especially in the sprints is what is which is what you'll see on on youtube they they generate power through uh brunelli's principle rather than allowing the water to roll off okay it's not as efficient but it's a lot quicker so they will have a very stiff fin and they will try and put, move the fin up that way and then move the fin down that way okay so uh fin swimmers high level sprinting fin swimmers you can watch videos on youtube and you'll see their legs a lot straighter and they have a really stiff fin and they're pushing the the, the, the fin through the water like this and this creates uh, forward motion and then they the other way and this creates more forward motion so they're trying to keep their legs super straight all right it's working on brunelli's principle of how the water moves fluid dynamics is it fluid dynamics panos can answer that but anyway um it it's it's a different mechanism and it's not very efficient but it's very fast and if they're only sprinting they don't need they don't need particularly efficiency all right so um how how much to bend your legs watch football players how much to move your head and shoulders watch fin swimming videos okay cool um so moving on julian now this is interesting because uh, we had this conversation julian's brought this question up and he's kind of reminded me of a question that we came at the uh, pool session last week by the way the pool session last week was fantastic we had 25 in the pool which is our legal limit we're not legally allowed any more in the pool than 25 um so if you want to come to the pool on thursdays book early book your ticket early to say to save disappointment and somebody was talking to us about neck weights and so and uh, julian's just reminded me about this this question what's a good time to use a neck weight um and and second one how do i know which weight it should be so neck weights are used uh in two different disciplines they're used for depth and they're used for dynamic and they are used for different reasons but very similar reasons but different so it's about weighting and balance okay so when you are going deep okay you tend to wear some weight to help you sink we're okay, going to make the swim down easier okay. and if you're uh swimming down let's have a try and get my uh, hand straight uh, there we go and you put weight here this is going to pull you downwards and you're going to say straight if you put ankle weights on it's going to pull you off so you're not going to sink very well okay you're going to want to sink feet first which you know you may want to but in most times you don't so the easiest type of weight to wear is a, as a weight belt which is in the middle because okay? it's easy you can buy it you know cheap you put it on you can change it super easy that's why most people wear weight belts because it's easy but it's easy you know to buy them okay? whereas if you wear a neck weight it's going to make the dive the sink phase as it were the glide easier because it's going to be pulling you towards the bottom okay. so when is a good time to use a neck weight in depth i would say the week before the competition because um you want to train especially if you're getting deep enough to, to have a glide you want to practice uh correcting so oh realistically you should wear ankle weights while training because that really pull you off okay you're really going to pull off that that that, that glide and you're going to have to work hard to keep yourself realistically ankle weights are you know really really difficult so stick with a weight belt and it's still going to pull you off and you have to correct your correct your corrections will be super super fine and quick and awesome so the week before the competition or the week before you're going to go deep then you put your neck weight on and it will suddenly be easier and your corrections are a lot slighter and a lot you know smaller similar sort of theory happens in a swimming pool where um if you imagine uh, just laying on a surface of the pool or say say uh, laying it laying flat about one meter under the surface 
most people, one meter under the surface, will float up. Now, most guys, their legs will sink and their heads will float up. Most ladies, they will kind of float up uh, the torso and the legs will float up together and they'll end up flat on, on the surface. Okay. Now, when we're free diving, dynamic, we want to stay that one meter below the water. Okay, we don't want to float up and we don't want to sink. We want to find that neutral buoyancy at one meter below the water. So I've just said guys tend to float up. Their legs sink and their heads float up. If you put a wetsuit on, it's still going to, your legs, still legs are going to be heavier than your head, but you're going to kind of float up together. So you want to put some weight as far forward as you can. Bear in mind most of the buoyancy is in your lungs because you've got you know a few liters of air there. So you want to put as weight as far forward as you can. Neck weight's good. Some people put uh, lead in their in their swim hats, or you can have lead on your on your on your wrists if you're swimming with your hands out in front of you. And the further forward you can put the weight, the less of it you need to level yourself up. Okay. Ladies will tend to find that they float uh, differently. And so you usually find ladies will have a kilo or two kilos on their weight belt, okay, to kind of keep them, but then they'll tend to float up head first, so you put maybe a kilo on their neck. Again, trying to get as much weight forward ahead of the lungs as you can to try and equal that out, to try and dive flat. So when is a good time to use a neck weight? When you're comfortable not using a neck weight. Don't rely on the neck weight to get you sinking or keeping you flat learn the skills and the more you dive without a neck weight the more difficult it's going to be but the more you're going to learn those skills if you rely on a neck weight to keep you straight so if you're if you're on your you know second or third pool session they put you in a streamlined suit and and get your weight in perfectly right you're never going to learn the skills of correcting well, yeah, because you've, you've, you've covered it all. So, join a club, train once a week, a couple of months, you learn how to correct, you'll learn your, your distance from the, from the bottom of the pool, and you'll know, oh, I'm a little bit deep, I'm a little bit sinky, I need to come up, I'm a little bit buoyant, I need to come down, whatever it is, okay, you'll learn that correction, and then when you put the weight on, the corrections are tiny and you can sleep more. Okay, so the question is, when's a good time to use neck weight? I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing uh, Julian was referring to one of the newbies who said neck weight. Um, I'd say two or, three two or three months into training when you're comfortable without a neck weight. Then you can use a neck weight to augment your dives rather than relying on it. Okay. Now, I, I have seen people, not so much these days, but you know, a few years ago, uh, people would be a bit, a bit floaty, maybe a lady, a little bit floaty, because ladies tend to float. <clears throat> oh, put weight on, put weight on, then you'll sink, put weight on. That's it. And they're happy that they're swimming underwater. Yay! But it's really hard work, because they put like four kilos on. And then they can't come up to the surface, because they got four kilos on. And they, have they actually improved? No, they've just swum underwater because you've tied weight to them. Right? Much better to learn how to dive, even if you're buoyant. Learn to dive. Learn to control. control. And then, when you put a neck weight on, or, or, or any sort of weight, it's going to make the dive easier. There you go. And how do I know what weight it should be? Well, <clears throat> in depth... You're just you you you've worked out what how deep you're going. You know where your neutral buoyancy is. You know where your safety systems are set up. So <clears throat> depends whether you're spear fishing, whether you're taking photographs, whether you're just uh, playing around, um, or whether you're competition diving. It depends what you're doing. You'll know which depth you want to be sinking at. And say you need three kilos to to be neutrally buoyant at the depth you've decided to be neutrally buoyant at then all you're going to do is split the weight between your neck and your and your and your waist if you've got three kilo neck weight yeah you could just put it on but it'll probably be a bit a bit cumbersome so you'll probably put one and a half here and one and a half on your waist yeah if you only want two kilos and you've got one and a half kilo neck weight 
one half here, half on your on your on your waist. So you're splitting it between your neck and your weight. So that's how, how you know which weight should be. In the pool, you do push and glides. Okay, so um, if you've got an hour pool session, uh, you know if you're training on your own, you've got an hour pool session. You can do maybe uh, let's say it takes a minute so you could easily do 40 push and glides 40 push and glides now remember if you just do a swim if you just do a dive you will learn absolutely nothing except that you've done the swim now if you do a push and glide and you float up and you do another push and glide not so full lung and you sink you've learned something so if you want to know how much weight to use in the pool, sign in for a session, book a session, book a lane, and you just push and glide. You don't need to go any deeper than half, uh, any further than half, half a length. Just push and glide. Video it, get your buddy to watch you, etc., etc. And <clears throat> when you can push and glide, and when you run out of steam, you don't float up this way. You kind of really slowly float flat, okay? you know you've got your weighting right. If you float up head first, ankle first, if you sink head first, sink ankle. Yeah, these are telling you where the weight is wrong. Obviously it's floating, it's not enough, sinking is too much. So you can adjust and you can tailor it. But I suggest you put, do five, at least five push and glides. Full lung, with your suit on if you're gonna wear a suit, or no suit if you're, you're balancing yourself for no suit, whatever it is, five of them. Boom, boom. Make notes. Then put one kilo on neck, five. Then one kilo on the waist, no none on the neck, five. Then one on the head, neck and one on the weight, five. <clears throat> By which time you've got a rough idea how you're sinking, how you're floating, and you'll also see whether when you're pushing, whether you're rocking to the side. <clears throat> and this might be a misbalance in your shoulders or your hips or your push. <clears throat> but you'll know you've done so five no weight five neck weight five uh, waist five so that's uh, five so that's 20 20 push-offs so that's half your session okay. but you've had one dive and then three learning dives change it up one dive three learning dives and you'll learn so much from that and that will tell you how much weight you should have and where you should have it just standard push and glass anyway I have gone on way too long. Uh, it's now uh, gone at eight o'clock. So I shall leave you there with those thoughts. Any questions, email them over, ask me at the pool session or message me, it's absolutely fine. I will see you next week um, for uh, the same again. And we'll um, thank you very much for joining us. Bye bye.